The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble, featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Aaron Kane today. Aaron, EK Financial Group, you've got the, the logo there on your shirt. But uh, Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, thank you for, for joining me. Um, that's just going to be a quick turnaround for this podcast. We're recording it on Wednesday. It's going to go live on Thursday morning. But thanks for joining me this morning. No problem, mate. Pressure's on. All good. Yeah. <laughs> Trying not to mess it up, as you said, and uh, have to record it a, a second time. Now, your 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 name has come up a few different times with okay. uh, guests that have been on the podcast and, and others that we kind of know, probably, we probably both know in the industry. So I yeah, appreciate getting to know you and spend a bit of time talking to you about your business. Um, no maybe let and we tend tend to start with you know what who's EK Financial Group? What's EK Financial Group? What's the what's the story there? No worries, mate. It's a long story, but I'll I'll won't be too long. But um, yeah, my old man started EK Financial Group back in eighty seven. Yeah, right. EK's his initials, Eddie Kane. Um, yeah, so he was those kind of tight agents back with A and P back then. When you're out doing you know selling whole life policies and so forth. Um, so he built the business up in those days. You you couldn't buy a business. It was like you're given. You know, you get the white pages and the newspaper articles classifi- classifieds, and you're looking for clients. So he started the business off like that, cold calling, um, and to where it is today. So you know, 35, nearly 40 years later, yeah. um, this is where we are. And yeah, he got me in the business when I was 21. So he typically was just him and a receptionist for a good 20 odd years until I came into the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started taking a bit more direction about building into more of a of an actual business, and, and that's um, you know saleable one day. And you no, know, yeah, and I just wanted to more help more people, so we started building a team around that as well. Um, yep. I've been in the business nineteen years now, turned forty only two months ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we had everything from you know obviously financial planning where he started off. He got into GI as well. So when I came in when I was 23, like as an, you know, AR, got into about 23, 24, yeah. was doing some GI work as well. Um, and then we decided to part with that and just stick to financial planning. And then I added uh, lending services, so mortgage broking about eight, nine years ago. And we've got a nice little team, about 10 at the moment. Mm. Utilize some offshore team as well. Um, yeah, and we're just in the southeast suburbs in Melbourne, brought an office last year in Willis Hill. Yeah, right. Yeah. Pretty much a little summary, summary of where we're at. <laughs> so 20, 21's an interesting, like you said you kind of came yeah. in at 21 and, and decided to try and make it more of a business rather than just the the one person. Yeah. Tw- 21 years old is a, your old resort is young to kind of have that that thought. Like what, had you done some business studies? Like how did you, uh, how did you come to that? Look, I think it came, it took a few years, right, to build that up. So, I wasn't right at 21. I decided mm. to change the business, but that was the model. Dad was not a big risk taker, so it was always him. He had, It was comfortable. He had an assistant and that was it and he got me on board, right? I, I did some studies at school, so I didn't get into getting into a degree that I wanted. So, I wanted to get into um, commerce degree at Monash, didn't get enough um, ITR back then. And so I went into banking finance at TAFE, at Swinburne, mm. completed that. And I was just kicking around and partying and dad's like, right, you're coming to work and at 21. And then I just learned the ropes from there, from sweeping the floors all the way up to where we are today. But I don't know, probably a good four or five years in, I'm like, we need more support. You know, we want to take the business in a bit more direction. Mm. Um, it was very transactional back then. So it was more salesy stuff. And I wanted to build more deeper relationships with clients 
not saying dad didn't have any good relations. We still have clients with us now that have been for three decades that are like, mm-hmm. how's your dad? How's your dad? So very loyal clients um, that are with us today still. But um, yeah, and then probably I reckon when I was probably more closer to 30, we were like, all right, I started running more of the direction of the business and the strategy of it. And um, I'm always, I was a go-getter and taking more risk and he was always telling me to slow down a little bit. But I think we worked well together. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like, so we, was your dad open to you coming in and like really pushing the direction of the business? Like how, how did that go between the two of you? Yeah, I definitely had to prove myself, right? Yeah. So early days as an advisor, um, being 23 when I got my AR, like, you know, I was seeing people talking about super selling life insurance and I'm just like... I don't know, back then I thought it was a con, like 23-year-old, very naive. I didn't know a lot, right? And I'm like getting paid this commission to sell these people this life policy and I'm like, Dad, this is like a con type of stuff. Like, what is it? And he's like, you don't understand what we can do for people um, when we're the only type of industry or profession that can help someone in a really bad situation with getting out of some financial difficulties. Mm-hmm. And not until I had my first claim I helped him with is really when I, my eyes opened up to them, like, oh, okay, I'm actually doing a really good deed here. Um, pe- a lot more people need this stuff, right? Um, and that's how I kind of started my career off. And he, I think, just saw that I had that mind for it and around business and changing processes and systems and making things more efficient, building the business up, um, doing pricing strategies of how we're going to charge and all this stuff for that where he didn't have all this in the past and implementing pricing policies. And so I think he saw I had a business knack and, and some keen expertise in it. So that's where he was like kind of when, as I started taking more direction, he was happy to let me step in and do a lot of that stuff. And he just focused on seeing people. Yeah. I was going to ask and you, you, you touched on it briefly just then anyway, but, but yeah, often – People, particularly when they're young and they're getting into financial advice and the insurance side of things, is like they don't really see the value of it until yeah. that first claim happens. And uh, no doubt, yeah. And, and like, like even me, I don't know how, but you know, I, I'm yet to have someone have a, a significant claim. Like, there's there's kind of little ones, a couple of IP policies, these kind of things. But in all of the years that I've been in it, I'm yet to have someone like. I know someone have a million dollar claim on a life insurance policy, these kind of things. So I'm yet to have that that light bulb moment. But it sounds like you had maybe you had that a bit earlier on in your career. I, I did. And then later on in my career, not not too long ago, I had a pretty significant claim. I actually had a TBD claim for my dad. Yeah. So yeah, so that was pretty that really brings pretty, it home. Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah. and he had insurance forever and a day. And this was only about sixty five, so about six years ago, five years ago. Um, yeah. He's got dementia and he's actually, unfortunately, in a home now at age yeah. 70. Um, but yeah, I had to do a TPD claim because he couldn't work. Um, mm. So that was a pretty hard transition for me and the family, mum, dad, and effectively feeling like someone having to take, well, I don't know, I don't know if you have to do this yet, but I'm assuming if you try, you have to take your keys off your parents one day, you can't do yeah. them all right. I had yeah, to take yeah, his keys yeah. off his business that he built from yeah. You know, from the ground up, which was pretty heartbreaking for everyone. Um, yeah. And that really hit home. And we had another significant claim only just um, about two weeks ago. got paid out a client of ours that was dad's client from 20, 30 years ago. Um, terminal illness. He's got like throat cancer, stage four. So we got about 850K paid out to him last week. Yeah. Um, yeah. But other than that, yeah, as you say, pretty small ones here and there and some trauma ones, decent mm-hmm. amount of trauma ones. But um, yeah, mm-hmm. it definitely does make a difference in people's lives. So was your dad was your dad still working in the business up until the TPD claim? Like yeah, he was. Five or so, whenever that was. Yeah, yeah. We we um, I actually had a few clients come to me. Something wasn't right. Like he was the strategies he was doing for thirty years, TTR and stuff. He was coming to me before going to me. He's going, oh, what am I doing here? I'm a bit more confused, and I'm re-explaining stuff. I'm like, it doesn't seem right. Like he gets this. He taught me how to do this stuff. And all right, he's mid sixties, but maybe something's not too right. But um, yeah, and then I had a client actually. Uh, that that was probably the first indicator, but we didn't do much from that. And then I had a client come to me and say, "I'm American. I'm a bit confused. I just had a meeting with your dad, and he was a bit over the shop and stuff like that." So and that client still is today a fantastic client. But um, he kind of came to me in confidence and told me that that that's a conversation with dad. So yeah, that really I think took it to the 
that final stage and that level around, well, I called a family meeting with mum, dad, we had to go doctors and something wasn't right. And and yeah, we obviously found the start of um, dementia, so plaque on the brain or calcium, they call it, so a build up. And yeah, and then he was like, he was, we kind of had to stop work because it was, you know, we're dealing with people's money, so it was pretty important stuff and you, I don't think you can work in those, those conditions and um, yeah, so it was tough, tough time. Yeah, of course. Um, yep. And um, yeah, but I had to kind of take his kingdom off him and say, you can't really see people anymore. Yeah, that would have been tough. And, 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 and a good a good sign of the um, kind of the, the, the depth of the relationship with the clients, that the clients kind of come in and said, yeah. something doesn't seem right and they're comfortable enough to, to have that conversation with you and um, the, the the trigger point for well, I guess what's unfolded since. Correct. Yeah. 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 It's huge. Yeah. yeah. Now I uh, talk us through the, the the makeup of the business as it stands at the moment. I I understand, and we were chatting, you know, briefly via email that you've been through a bit of a tra- you know significant mm. transition in the business. There's obviously the events with your dad transpiring, but just in the with the clients and the, and the operations yeah. of the business as as it stands at the moment. Cool. Can we spend a bit of time talking through that? Because I think there'll be some value in in it for for people that might be listening. Definitely. Can, Definitely. can you talk us through what what the business looked like yep. maybe a few years back? Mm-hmm. Number of clients, what you were doing for them. I don't know if you can talk general about fees and things. Up to you, what, how much you want to disclose. But um, and and then we'll kind of work through what you've done to where you are today. Perfect, no problem. Um, it's a pretty good story. I've told this a few times, but um, back probably about 2017, Dad and I were we're a good team, right? So we we'll, we probably went a little early on the whole fee for service than what the industry pushed. So we started doing flat fees, right? So this is when we still had grandfathered, you know, um, getting paid, you know, AUM fees and stuff like that through policies. Where we decided to let's not do that. Let's go a flat fee for advice. For people, we set up four service packages. Back then, we only had to offer reviews, so we had the basic one. We called it just a basic membership. It was I think it was about four five hundred dollars a year, and that was for a review off every three years. There was a central service, which was a review, review off every two years, and that was about um, thirteen hundred dollars. There was an annual review, which was how we called our priority package, and that was um, about twenty five hundred dollars a year. And then we had a premium, which is six monthly, and it was three to four thousand dollars a year. All right, so me and Dad, we are pretty like go getters. We're really um, when we put our minds to something, we'll really achieve it. And and we had a really good business model, right? So between the two of us, we had about three hundred and fifty entities. So husband, wife, singles, that type of thing, um, on one of these four packages. So we're doing okay. Um, I think there was circa 450k in revenue from those clients, um, and we were signing up clients. No one was saying no. We just thought we we're awesome at what we're doing, but we found out we're just too cheap later on. <laughs> no one said no. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, roll commission obviously hits, and there was grandfathering getting turned off, and there was a lot of this stuff happening with our licensees. So I knew that we needed help. Something wasn't right. Well, we had a good business, but we're working still long hours, long days, lots of meetings, seeing lots of people. And I'm like, everything's good, but something's not working out right. So yeah, I engaged a business coach um, past post Royal Commission. So back 2019, 20. Um, yeah, and Baz Gardner, I think you know as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. engaged with Baz, and um, yeah, he said you guys got an awesome business model, but you're way too cheap. That's the issue, right? And that's why no no one's saying no because it's not because you really you are really good at what you do and how you articulate value, but the price point's just too cheap. So people aren't buying into the whole value piece or the relationship as much as they should be. They're just like, oh, I'm getting a little service here, great. So that was all okay. But then what we did, we went through a, like a two-year period with Baz of, um, and Dad had kind of moved out of the business at this stage, but a two-year process of like a transformational process of the business and um, resetting relationships with our clients. Um, so we went from, took about two years, we went from about 350 entities to about 150. Um, and we pretty much doubled the revenue in that those clients. Um, yeah. Changed the fee model. We made it a bit more basic. We just had it either once a year or twice a year. We didn't have, because then by now it was like you had to deliver advice. It wasn't about review offers. So we had to have a package that we actually have to see people every year. Yeah. 
Um, and the amazing thing was that like those other people that we turned off, <clears throat> we didn't kick them out or get rid of them. We just we had a really good relationship and conversation with them about that. Um, it's not in your best interest for us to charge you because we have to charge at this price point and see you once a year now and there's there's the value's not right there yet or I don't feel comfortable charging you that amount for what you need to do. So go into our ad hoc arrangement and pay for advice as you need it and see mm-hmm. fit. But hey, guess what? I'll reach out to you when I see an opportunity for you to come back into an advice fee paying rela- relationship and engagement so we can really accelerate your wealth and everything moving forward. So Typically, we find that we've got this pool of funds of these ad hoc clients, which is long-term clients, good relationships. We're not getting paid from them. But this ad hoc transactional stuff we are doing, so we are charging fees for those as we need to. Mm. But we typically find that maybe 10 to 15 a year are popping back onto a, an annual advice agreement now because their life stages are changing. They're getting more debt, more kids. They're getting a bit older. They've got more wealth behind them. They want to plan stuff out a bit better. So that's been the evolution and then we've, in the last few years, we've grown that 150 advice fee paying clients to about 175 at the moment and then there's circa about 1.2 mil of rev on those clients. So yeah. our average advice fee is about seven, yeah. seven and, per year. And so they're, they're still flat fees, so you had kind of the, the four flat fee arrangements, you've still got, uh, uh, is it? Is it two distinct packages, you pay X or you pay Y, or is it a little bit more bespoke than that? No, more bespoke, and it's it's per client, per the relationship they want, but also what they're going through in their life. So what Baz taught us was like, he's done a lot of research and showed us like, we pretty much set our feet about 1.1% of your thumb. If you looked at what we're charging, four grand for someone on a million bucks, we were hardly covering the risk of that client. Right, the risk fee is probably 0.3, 0.4. So it's probably cost you three grand just in risk to have that client on your books. So we weren't actually getting a margin for time for effort for any profit. Um, so we changed it and I have this open conversation with my clients. We use 1.1% as an indicator of what we charge you, but we turn it into a flat fee and that's the flat for the 12 month period. And we typically, there's research done where one to one and a half is kind of where the market sits typically. Um, I'll cap that if they've got quite a few million dollars um but so yeah and then we set a minimum in there as well so our minimum started on forty five hundred dollars a year we're up to about five and a half a year now as a minimum so for 60 a month so as long as there's enough value we can deliver they've got enough thumb to justify as well clients will go on an annual advice fee someone with 200k 300k probably won't put them on there but we'll do transactional work maybe just do a one-off to get them set up and let them go and maybe touch base every two years and see if they need any more help or advice. Yeah. What are the, do, do you have some triggers set up on your side for you know this this pool of, of clients that you said, hey, there isn't the value in, in me charging these fees anymore and you've, you've kind of switched off the advice fees. They're, they're still there in some way, shape or form, but you're not, you're not charging them a fee. Do you have triggers set up for you to reach out to them like I don't know, they turn 60 or something like that. Can you talk through any triggers you might have set up for that? Probably not triggers based on life stage or something, but we we do have automation through our CRM, which we do touch base every two years with them via automation, email, text messages. Has your life changed? Do you want to have a chat? Let's have a phone call, discovery call, and see where it takes us from there. Um, and then I would, if they do want to book in, I'll charge them for that initial consult. It's yep. it's just to get rid of Tyke. It's only four hundred forty dollars. It's not big, but it's just there to make sure that they're serious about having a conversation and wanting to take the next step to maybe get them into an engaged relationship moving forward from there. So, yeah, we do that every two years. They get that that automation come out, but also to my um, was associate, but Zach that's been working with me for the last six years. He's come into every single one of my meetings. Um, he's now kind of targeting those people on those lists. Okay. And so how do you – so you you decide you're going to make this transition. At, you've uh, – can you, can you talk through the work that you did prior to sitting in front of the client to say, hey, we're changing the way we do things? Yeah. What was what was that work like? What, what were you doing before you sat down with the client to say we're going to change things? That was a lot of uh, one-on-one coaching with Baz and really it was about changing the mindset that I had <laughs> around charging for advice and for fees and see my own value. The problem was that where we came from, someone maybe like probably the one of the biggest 
uplifts I did in one conversation was 1500 to 10K, right? But that client didn't even bat an eyelid and was like, yeah, I thought you were too cheap beforehand um, <laughs> and was fine with it. And so a lot of the the work up, the lead, lead up work was about coaching me through the conversations and the relationship of how do I have this conversation? I thought I'm going to lose all my clients. I'm going to look like an absolute tool. What am I doing? How can I charge people this amount of money? Um, I just didn't really understand the true value. And this has been been advisor for 15 years at this time. And I still wasn't charging based on what I was worth. So a lot of that was personal one-on-one coaching with Baz to myself Mm -hmm. um, to understand that, but then also to help me articulate and set an agenda for the meetings, these transitional conversation meetings and resetting relationships and how to deal with um, the expectation that I have on myself, but also how to deal with potential um, outcomes in those conversations and talks and if there's any pushback on them as well. And what what – what does it kind of an outline of that agenda of sorts look yep. like? Yep. So the agenda I had, so he helped me build this. This is something Baz builds called RCVE. So reason, concept, value, expectation. Okay. It's like, it's your why, right? So, but he's put it in a structured format. So for me to articulate that in a story to, to people, to clients, to new clients and everything. So what's the reason I really do what I love doing, right? Get up every day and come and come to this office. Um, See, was what's the um, RCV, what did I say? Reason, concept. Concept, yeah. Yeah, concept. What's the concept around that? So, how can this person relate to that reasoning? So, in my reason, a lot's around family, right? And then my kids and building this business and the legacy we've got with dad and stuff like that. So, I bring it to that. Uh, the value, so what value they get back in return for this relationship. And most importantly, which probably a lot of people don't do, is the expectation so what's the expectation of this relationship? What do I expect from you as a client of EK and what can you expect from us to give you back in return? And I think that's one of the most important pieces of the puzzle is the expectation piece because when you're giving people rules of engagement of how we're going to operate and work together, the relationship steps up one and it becomes a lot more powerful because it's just not like they're using us as a service. It's actually a deeper relationship um, so that was the initial one, the RCVE to kind of reset, explain that times have changed, the industry's changed, we can't keep doing what we're doing before and that's totally okay. And also let them know it's totally fine if this is not okay for you anymore. I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you're giving these people this permission to back out, right? but a lot of the time they go, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm in with you, right? Um, but giving them permission to say no and to back out is pretty powerful. Then I'll just go through your normal deep dive into the fact finding, but really try to scratch deeper. A lot of the time I'd be, because a lot of my meetings that and the coaching with Baz, I had to record my meetings with my clients and he'll watch them. And as daunting as it is, he'll go through and then we'll replay back and he'll be saying, see this point here? And you're like, oh my God, I can't look at this. <laughs> it's so embarrassing <laughs> watching myself. Um, but yeah, coach me through like individual conversations, individual clients of how I said this, I should have said this, or should have dig deeper here and talked about that. So really helped train me to do all that stuff. Yeah, and then and then there was a fee conversation. So really pres- position that fee um, and you do a deep dive around the explanation of it as well. One of the things we did as well, we changed the, the initial fee. When I say initial fee, initial advice, I say onboarding cost. Mm-hmm. So the onboarding cost for you to our practice is X. And you get three things for that. The three things you get is the plan. So a recap on what we spoke about in the meeting, and this is what's going to be incorporated in the plan. The second thing you get is when we see you again, we'll have all the paperwork ready to go. So we'll implement the whole lot, all right? So you don't have to worry about getting it wrong and making a big error. We'll do it for you. And the third thing you get is the peace of mind. Like we assume risk on the advice. If anything was to go wrong, we fix it. So you're paying for that peace of mind. Reassure them that nothing's gone wrong, but that's what they get for the onboarding. Um, let me just yeah go into the ongoing relationship piece and talk about how that we don't want to set and forget things in your life will change. You need clarity consistently given to you around where you're at. Keep you accountable and objective of your own situation. Um, and for that, we need to have an engagement ongoing. And I'm very transparent. Say, look, our engagements are 12 monthly contracts. If you don't like 
if I'm not delivering your value, I'm not setting your expectation, don't sign next year. But it's my job to make sure that I'm doing a fantastic job that you're going to be saying, where's the contract I'm going to sign again? <laughs> yeah, and, and every now and again, you'll get one or two drop off. Like if you've seen 170 a year, you know, just they just feel that and, and both both sides of the parties too, right? Yeah. We could even say to guys, I think you don't need this anymore. Um, and yeah, then we kind of justify between if it's going uh, every six months or every 12 months. Um, typically, we price the six months just a bit higher. We might do 1.5%. Um, um, but but I know I probably want about a 13K minimum on a six-month contract. Yeah, right. um, seeing people every six months. Um, but how I do that is really I picture to clients like you're going through a trans- transitional or really transformational period in your life. So as an example, someone retiring in 12 months' time. Right, they're going through the financial stuff, but the emotional, the psychological, stopping work, not being needed anymore. There's a lot of stuff that they're going to be going through in their mind. It's not just about the restructuring of assets. You know, that's an important piece, but that's the end bit, right? So I say, look, let's do a six monthly engagement for the next two years to get you through this transitional piece. Then once you're through it, we'll drop back to once a year, and your fee will come back down. Yeah, okay. And typically. That's typically why I'll use the six monthly one for a transitional period, or if someone's got a real a decent amount of money that they want to just keep their finger on the pulse a bit more and get more updates. And then later on, when they're retired, I'm just like, hey, drop down to once. And some retirees like, no, no, I want to keep seeing you every six months. I'm like, okay, yeah. And so through that, so no, so through, through that process, you obviously your, your client numbers came came down. There's an element of them where you've kind of said this isn't for you anymore anyway, so yep. they've, they've 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 come off. But of those that that you really wanted to keep, was there many of them that just said no, nah, this isn't for me anymore? The ones that we did keep, yeah, yeah. it's funny actually. So out of those three hundred odd conversations, how many do you think said you're too expensive? I'm going. Ah, uh, I. <laughs> Only because I've spoken to Baz and others that have gone through this, I, I reckon north of eighty percent said, "Sure, I'll pay the higher fee and stick around." Yeah, I think of six said no. Yeah, it's incredible. And Baz said to me, "You're not charging more enough." I'm like, "Oh my god, are you serious?" Because it, so it was like people didn't say no. Correct. Yeah. Right. Still not charging hard enough. I was like, <laughs> "Man, I just went from here to here, and now you tell me I've got to go again." Yeah. Um, no, so yeah, seriously, about six were like, and and look, to be honest, there was probably one or two there that I really shocked me, um, and did hit me, and I still think about it sometimes. I'm like, mm. I can't still work, can't believe they went, but yeah, I was expecting. We did numbers on ten to fifteen percent okay. going no, and about four or five percent, like a small percentage was under ten percent. You know, said no, but then the ones that did hang around, the the engagement is much deeper. One of the funny things that Baz talks about a lot and that I've learned now has taken about two, three years is that when you are charging enough that it hurts, right, and the people are really brought into the relationship and the mm-hmm. advice, mm-hmm. right, if you're not charging enough, they don't see the value and they're not, ah, oh, that's like two grand, it's fine. If it works, it works, it doesn't, it doesn't, right? But if you are charging enough, they're really brought in the advice, they listen to you, they take your advice on they consult you regularly because they want your opinion on things. Yeah. But one of the really important things is that you start getting really good referrals, right? And they give you up referrals because I don't get clients now calling me going, oh, my nephew with four credit cards needs help. Uh, he's broke and he's got no job. Can you speak to him? It's like, well, they know that I'm charging them seven, eight, nine, ten grand. They're not going to give me someone that's not going to be similar to Can't themselves. Pay. So yeah. I'm, I'm getting now referrals from my existing clients and and actually the existing clients now give me the most referrals like the referral we're getting three four percent a year in referrals from them are probably like 20 percent. so i reckon 20 percent of clients are referring to us now um their friends their family their bosses like people that are similar to them in their lives as well and i keep getting told at like nearly every meeting oh, i told my, my sister about you and expect a call or i told my cousin or my my friend we said oh you got to go see aaron and do this do that so yeah, you start getting really good referrals as well, which is a, a crazy byproduct of it. Yeah. So, is it just you seeing the clients? Like, it, it, what, what's your advisors like you? You got another advisor in the business? Yeah. So, Zach, I mentioned earlier. So, yep. Zach started with us six years ago, straight out of uni. Um, he was finishing off his last year. He did some casual to start with. And then, when he finished, we gave him a full time position. 
one pointer I got from years ago from another mate in MDRT. He said, look, don't go to a meeting ever on your own. Take someone with you. And I haven't not done that since. And it is a game changer, seriously. Like, so I got Zach in. He started as an associate, so not an AR. He'll come into meetings, take all my notes. I'd walk out of the meeting. He's doing all the file notes, setting up power planning stuff, getting to the power planners, talking to the admin team, doing everything right, strategy. I'll just sign off and review and train him as we went. And then he became an AR two, three years in. So he's been AR a couple of years now. Um, and But I didn't let him go straight away and go, mate, go and see all your friends and sign them up. I'm like, mate, when we just went through a process of getting rid of a lot of that clientele. We've now got our position, a business in a position now where this is the type of echelon of clients that we're dealing with and we need to keep that because that did cause headaches and we had to solve that issue, right? So probably to his dislike or whatever, I, I didn't just let him go out there and sign up anyone and write little insurance policies and stuff. So he still sat under, under myself and been in all my meetings. So He's been in all my client meetings for the last, as I said, four or five years. So this year, though, one of our main goals for our business, the North Star we set, was to transition 50 advice fee paying clients to Zach. Yeah. Um, and we're at like 49 at the moment. So, mm. and we've got like a couple of weeks to Christmas. Yeah, so, one more to find. Yeah, one okay. more to find. So we'll get there. And that was our that was our goal. But the idea now that is that those clients that are, are set up and there's not as much tra- like transformational stuff happening, then there's the conversation where I said, look, Zach's going to run point moving forward. I'm here. The business is growing, so I'm all running on the business as well, but I'm here to oversee everything that Zach's doing and we put our heads together and work on strategy, sign you off and, and all that as well, but he'll run point. I'll pop in and out say hi and be involved in a relationship, but he's going to be your man now in the go-to and, and they're like, yep, no problem. So we've had a good success in that this year and yeah, and, and now he's got, you know, his average fee because he's got transition from me. He's got five, six, seven thousand dollar clients, right? He's not going signing up people for twelve hundred dollars, yeah. Where okay. we know you can't make money on and are unprofitable. So, yeah. And then next year will just be an evolution of that. And the idea now, so out of the one seventy, I'm down about one twenty now. Um, I can already feel a bit of relief taken off me, and or if I'm like, man, I can't do this meeting, you do it. He just does it for me. So I'm like, mm. I've got that bit more breathing space now, and I'm really focused and targeted on like, yeah, getting. Building um, CO, like center of influence relationships and strategic partnerships with the accounting firms and so forth, so we can really build up the alliances with these other firms that I didn't have a chance to do previously. So now we're really targeting the ideal client, and this is where we're at, and really showing them our value and what we can do to the relationships. So I've got one accounting firm we're doing a bit of work with at the moment, which is going really well. Um, mm-hmm. And that's allowing me to still do what I love doing because Baz called me, like, I'm the rainmaker, I'm great at like engaging relationship building and and kind of getting people on board and zach's good at that but he's also really good at the ongoing nurturing and relationship stuff as well yeah yeah and mdrt you mentioned mdrt there what, what's your involvement with with them i see from socials you're off to chicago seems to be yeah a couple so I've been involved. 2016 was my first annual meeting so i used to go just to the, the ones in melbourne they ran so at brighton your club every quarter be 100 200 people there that have great speakers like one mdrt member would talk about their business and share all their ideas and they'll get some maybe guest speaker in and i just i got invited by a licensee actually because i used to buy tables and i went to it and i'm like this thing's really good like it's about people opening and sh- opening their doors sharing giving ideas not hiding stuff it's like hey there's plenty of work for everyone this is how i do this ask me anything you want right well this is a really good kind of network because mm. when when I was dealing in, in my last seat back then everyone was kind of siloed and you have a couple of friends you speak to and talk to but not everyone shared so much MDRT is really about doors open and, and you share and give back and you'll get back in return right so I just started going to these things each quarter myself I just started paying for a ticket and going so I thought this is cool knew a few guys there from my license met some more people and I'm like you got to come to an annual meeting I'm like oh what's this about I'm like well every year in June they go to North America somewhere or Canada and there's, you know, 10,000 people attend. You have to be an advisor to go. Um, you got to qualify to be a member. Yeah, I went to my first one in 2016, Vancouver, um, and total eye-opener. Um, met some, built some relationships there that I've still got today. Got close relationships with a lot more people in Melbourne and Australia as well that are advisors in, in other licenses. So, it gave me, um, I guess, a look into other licensees and how other people work and having relationships outside my own little cohort. 
So that's been really good as well. So I've got people from all around the world. I can probably pick up the phone now and or shoot an email and say, mm. hey, I've got this issue. Um, what do you do? And a lot of these businesses are three, four, five, six times as, size, the big, as big as mine, right? Um, and the small operators in there too. And so I'm sharing back. I'm, I'm mentoring actually five aspirants at the moment that want to qualify to be a member of MPRT. So I'm doing mentorships there. Um, and as you just give back and you help, I actually sat on the Victorian committee for two years. Um, well, on the committee for five. I'm still on it now, but I was the chair for two years. So I ran those events in Brighton for two years with our, with our group of people. Um, yeah, and I've just been going back every year. So going to the annual meetings. And as I said, I kind of got friends all around the world now. So Zach and I had the great opportunity to go to um, Harvard and study in, in May this year. So um, we won some awards through our, our network and the trip was all the to win you actually got a trip to harvard for a week and we studied there and so i uh, had a financial planning client from mgrt that lives in boston so i reached out to him and yeah he took us to his practice showed us everything brought his whole team out with us took us out for the night yeah just the networks and they're actually him and his fam wife and kids coming to melbourne in two weeks so we're gonna then see them and yeah return the day meet, meet lee and my kids as well and yeah it's just a really good network and as they see you helping they they then offer you roles, right? So H- HQ, so they're in they're in Chicago. But as you're doing things, I go, hey, do you want to be on this committee? Do you want to be on this engagement group or whatever it might be? We'll fly to Chicago, come out, and you'll be on this committee with these other people from around the world. So yeah, I was there last month. I'm on an engagement committee now to try and get more engagement with members, um, see where we can improve some systems and stuff like that. And it's probably a group of about 10 of us and, yeah, a couple from Canada, a few from around America. So now mm-hmm. there's new people I've met. And so when I go to the annual meeting, it's actually back to Vancouver next year in June. Just brought my flights the other week. But, yeah, looking forward to going. And, yeah, there'll be a bunch of new people I'll get to mm-hmm. speak to and meet as well. Perfect. Everyone everyone uh, that I speak to talks really highly of it. So uh, thanks for thanks Got to for sharing. I if you're an advisor, I'd, I'd say, look, give it a crack one day. Just join up, go to an annual meeting and see what you if what it's about, if it's for you or not, right? A lot of people do it and go back. Some people do it just because they want to tick a box and they've done it once or twice. But yeah, it's a great network of people. Um, I think there's the stigma of it, of like this whole hoo-ha, you know, American nice type of thing. And uh, look, it was built on life insurance that's what it was you know 70 odd years ago but it's really more whole person now a lot more holistic so wealth management yourself your business your family um yeah very more holistical Mm. um take on it and it's not just risk focus it's very business operator focus and as you get up there and you become the higher level you do mingle with people like you are running. We're running practices, right? Okay. So we've got the same issues, clientele, finding staff, technology. How do you solve this problem with clients, get more revenue, the, it's cut costs. So there's a lot of stuff just outside of selling. There's that's the whole business operation as well. And Yeah, yeah. And how, do you, how do you, what's, what's the, like how do you get up the levels? What's that all about? Is that about like revenue? Is that how long you've been there for? What's it? Yeah, what's rev typically. So you got to, qualify so qualification is a certain amount you gotta write each year and probably most people listening probably will be there or close to it but so maybe when you're starting out you're still building up but i don't have the numbers be exactly but between one and 200 grand a year you probably got to write right and and manage or something like that and it's not just risk associated you can account fees like one-off fees annual fees that type of thing so the new, new PYs and stuff are probably a couple of years from getting there potentially. Um, Zach will qualify because he's now looking after 50 clients that are bringing in decent revenue. So he'll yeah, qualify yeah. straight away. Then you've got um, qualification, you've got quarter of the table, which is maybe half a mil, and then you've got top of the table, which is a mil plus, um, which I sit in the top, mm-hmm. top of the table. Um, the only major difference is top of the table get their own conference um, later on in the year in September, October, and it's in Hawaii next year i'm looking to go there the first time everyone says that they go is the best conference they put on it's a lot smaller maybe 400 attendees and mm. not like ten thousand. and it's a really good partner program so the partners come they get engaged with the whole you know the whole conference and they spend a lot of time with the other partners of people there as well so you build really good relationships as well 
but yeah, I'll probably give that one a crack next year. Yeah, fantastic. Aaron, thanks for joining me this morning. We might wrap it up there. Appreciate you spending some time with me. Really got a lot out of it. I'm going to listen back. I don't listen back to many of the episodes, but we'll listen back to this around the transition that you've been through. Uh, Hopefully others that are listening got a fair bit out of it. Uh, Aaron, thanks again for, for joining me. No problem. Thanks for having me.